Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome you guys to the uh, yet another lecture of um, Applied Analytics, a Practitioner's Approach and this uh, lecture today we will be uh, discussing some of the aspects of why decisions are needed, why analytics is needed and all other aspects of it and I am Dr. Deepa Fale from IIT Kanpur. So today's topic of lecture is decision needs and analytics. So we all have, uh, it is a very simple word says need for decision making and why is analytics necessary. So today what we are going to see is uh, why is decision an important thing for business entities. So we all know that, that business entities, business entities which we implies that business organizations or here we are mostly dealing with for profit organizations. Yeah. Uh, this is applicable to non-profit organizations as well, but today we are uh, more focusing on for-profit decision making. And these organ entities have to make decisions at various levels, okay. So decision making happens at different levels or various levels within this. And these decisions, the, these decisions by business entities. Uh, result or influence uh, various uh, aspects of the organization. So when we say that we make decisions at various levels, what we are suggesting is that these decisions will have various impacts in the organization. So various aspects of the organization will be influenced by this decision. So the first part we are talking about it is the various impact, the varying impact. So when we talk about this, we are talking about impact period, period which implies the duration, the duration to which the decision, uh, the impact of decision remains, impact of decision remains, okay. So uh, for example, it can like a classic example of this would be like a Tata Land Rover uh, acquisition. Here we know that uh, Land Rover is a British company which makes SUVs and it was acquired by Tata Motors in, of India and that was more of a long range or a long term acquisition where the impact of this acquisition was is shown in Tata Motors till today because they had to take a lot of money and how much of debt and other aspects has been taken into picture and the finances of the company was affected and uh, all other aspects. But ja Land Rover made a lot of profit so that also helped the Tata Motors in getting their annual sales up in a much larger value. So the, the decision there was to whether to acquire that Jaguar Land Rover was the quest decision that was to be made by then CEO of Tata Motors. And so that impact of the decision even after that CEO has left a new CEO came in and another CEO has jo just now joined Tata Motors till the impact till now the impact of the decisions uh, that decision is still lingering in that company. So the impact of the decisions, the time period with which this impact happens is one of the most important points what we can talk about in why business entities make the decisions. Second aspect is about the scale of the decision which means how big or how much, how big or how much of the organization, organization is impacted by the decision, 
is impacted by the decision. A uh, classic example of this would be like you know, uh, it is you can think about it as a financial value of the decision in a way. Okay. So, example let us talk about is the GST versus state tax. So, let us talk about the GST which is something that was that the impact of the GST is across the entire nation, uh, the country of India. Whereas, let us say the state of Andhra Pradesh increases the tax by something, then the only impact resides within the state of Andhra Pradesh. So, the scale of the impact of the decision made by the parliament of Andhra Pradesh would probably be just limited to the state of Andhra Pradesh. Whereas, the parliament of India when it made the GST decisions to impose GST in the country, that decision impacted across the nation for every state altogether. So, the scale of the impact of the decision uh, in that case is uh, was pretty large. Okay. Then the third aspect we talk about is the scope of the decision, which means the area uh, to which the decision impacts. So, for example, when uh, Boeing uh, we will do this as an example. Okay. When Boeing decided to make Dreamliner or what we call it as the 787 aircraft with the help of uh, uh, composites, okay. the impact of it was initial impact of this was or the initial scope of the decision was to the production okay, uh, of aircraft. But due to the weight reduction of that was resulting out of the uh, usage of uh, um, uh, composite materials, that decision had a larger scope because in the during the time of operation, find out that because the weight was reduced, since the weight was reduced, the necessary lift that was necessary was also reduced, and in that process, the drag was reduced, and it results in better operational fuel efficiency. efficiency. So, you can think about it thus the decision to use composites to build 787 aircraft, the scope which was to the manufacturing of the aircraft later translated to the operational scope where the aircraft returned fuel efficiency due to reduced weight. Then we also talk about two type of other decisions which is called as strategic and tactical decisions. In a simplest way to think about it is strategic decisions the strategic decisions are typically they are long term decisions. The duration, the time period of impact of this decision are quite long, whereas tactical decisions are they are short term decisions. Sometimes tactical decisions are also called as operational decisions. Okay. So, what we are doing here is this is to tactical decisions mostly deal with the day to day aspects of a business, whereas strategic decisions are mostly long term, which are also another way to look about is visionary aspects or we can think about it as long term growth and other aspects of a company. Okay. So, after this what we will now do is we will try to talk about the needs of the decision, decision needs we can classify this into four layers or four categories or four groups on the scale, the scale of the decisions and the degrees of freedom that are available to the decision maker. This uh, four layers has been proposed by Rahul Saxena and Srinivasan in 2013 and this is actually a, we think this concept is of quite importance in, to this uh, analytics. So, let us see what does that actually amounts to. So, there are four major layers of decision making. So, uh, what we said is uh, decision needs needs vary with decision layers. Okay. As the layers changes, the needs of the decisions, the, deci the needs, this decision needs are the needs of the decision maker. And when the decision maker is making decisions, 
he would require different data. So, data which will be typically provided by analytics. Okay. So, since the needs are different, the data are different and the data is different. So, the analytics to be done on the data, that particular decision maker is also different. So, the layers of decision, the four major layers that we talk about, the layer number one we talk about is the workflow decisions. Okay. So, these decisions, decisions that are taken, that are taken at the workplace regularly, at the workplace regularly. Saxena et al def defines it this way or what we can basically told, think about these are, these are day to day decisions. Okay. And the decision maker is the worker himself okay. and the occurrence, they occur frequently, frequently and governed by, governed by uh, set rules and guidelines. So, there are rules and guidelines that are available for this and they basically uh, control, though they basically govern these decisions. And the other aspect of it is that these decisions, these decisions, the workflow decisions, okay, these are all the workflow decisions. These decisions are constrained by schedule and allocation. Allocation. So, when you say schedule, schedule we all know what a schedule is about. Schedule is a who is going to do what and allocation is who is allotted what task. So, depending upon the schedule and the allocation which is the constraints for the decision maker, workflow decisions are made. But these are day to day decisions, they are basically made in the workplace, they are made on a regular decisions, their impact is not very high. Okay. So, these are also you can think about these as the low impact decisions. They are important, but that means their impact on the organization is not that huge. Okay. The next what we talk about is the control decisions. So, let us see what is a control decision is. The control system decisions. Okay they allocate resources to workloads uh, to meet an objective. Okay. And what, were, what are some of these objectives? The objectives would be maximize revenue, okay. uh, meet a deadline, etcetera. So, in this control layer of decisions, what the typical decisions is you allocate resources to workloads. Okay. Resources can be man, machine, materials, money, methods, those kind of things and workloads you can think about it as various tasks, various tasks needs to be performed. Okay. And these decisions are typically constrained, these decisions are constrained by what two things, what is capacity and availability. So, we are constrained by capacity and availability of whom? Of resources. Okay. So, capacity and availability of resources constrains such type of decisions that are in the control layer and there is one more constraint as part of this. Okay. This is the also sometimes, not every times, sometimes constrained by strategy. Okay. Because what happens is, you know, uh, he, here you are basically allocating resources to workload. Hence, in many times, this is also known as the schedule layer decisions, schedule layer of decision making. Because Scheduling is the process of allocating, allocate resources to tasks, 
this is called as scheduling. Okay. So, when somebody says this is scheduling means or you are doing a schedule, you are allocating resources to task. Hence, this control layer is also called as the scheduling layer. Then we talk about the next layer which is called as the capabilities layer. In the capabilities layer, the aim is to create capabilities uh, as laid out by strategy. So, in this case what we are doing is if the strategy says we are to in a manufacturing facility the strategy says double the production uh, currently let us assume that this is a car manufacturer who is producing 1000 cars and we, uh, the strategy says double the production to 2000 cars. So, to do that we have to uh, there has to be additional machines that need to be procured new people need to be hired and all those kind of things. So, that kind of things buying the new machines hiring new people that is all result in what we call as creating the capacity. Okay. So, once you are create the capacity you will be capable of meeting the strategy and this capacity of which gets all allocated to resources from there you do day to day operations. So, here the um, uh, what we are typically try to do is we change or modify capacity to uh, meet the specified target. Okay, that is one part and the constraints on this decisions typically constrained by constrained by organizational strategy. When we say constrained the way we are using the word constraint we are using the word in the form of a governing. So, here the organization strategy what the organization want to do what the organization wants to do do uh, in future you can think about that as being the roughly the word of strategy here but depending on that you will come up with a new specified target and using that you create the capabilities to meet that target. So, hence in some of the cases this is also called as the planning layer of decision making because you are making doing all sort of plans to meet your organizational strategy. And then the last layer of decisions that we are going to talk today is the network layer of decisions. It is also known as the strategy layer as the strategy layer and this is also the topmost layer of decision making. And there are no constraints in this no constraints other than the the vision of the organization so like for example an or every organization has a vision a long time vision why do they exist there is a common goal uh, for example, like um, an organization like Greenpeace, their existence is for the betterment of the earth and mankind and ensure that every uh, the entire earth is protected, the, uh, the entire ecology is protected and those kind of things. And if Greenpeace decides to make a build a nuclear bomb, then that will be against the vision of the organization. So, other than the vision of the organization that constrains this, the network decision or the strategy layer decisions are not constrained by anything else. So, the vision of the organization in another way we can think about it as vision is equivalent to the intent of the organization what it wants to do what it wants to do. So, this vision of the organization decides how do we you know go from there. So, this is the topmost layer as I said we and from here the decisions typically flow in one direction. Okay. It can be flowing in other directions also some decisions taken in the workflow can also come this way. So, you can think about it as a bi-directional flow. Okay. So, 
Now let us talk about the needs of the decisions. Now we talked about what are the layers. So, as we said earlier, decision needs vary according to the layers in which the uh, decision is made. Okay. So, in which layer? So, if you are doing the if you are making the decisions at the lower most layer or what we call as the workflow layer to top most layer which we can also call it as the uh, the strategy layer or the network layer uh, the needs of the decisions are or the decision makers are quite different so each layer determines how do we go from there so there are these decision needs you can classify them into three major decision needs okay so the needs for decision um, can be classified into three categories and these needs all have a specific place where these decisions are being made so the first one we talk about is the proactive decision needs so the proactive decision need proactive decision needs they arise from the need to set and bribe policies so you need to set and drive policies hence the origin originates at the network layer or the strategy layer okay network or the strategy layer and what typically happens is these needs then cascades down to other layers in the form of in which form in the form of policies so various policies that are set at the strategy layer drives the uh, drives this need for decision so the proactive literally means you know take decisions in anticipation okay, we are going to think about if this is going to happen if this happens how will we deal with this decision that is what we are going to do as part of this so the proactive decision typically sets uh, in the policies and that policies start to trickle down into the uh, lower layers of the um, decision making then the second one we are going to talk about is the reactive decision making so the reactive decision needs reactive needs or reactive decision needs uh, are uh, done when there is an alert about something in the system so here what we are taking is take decisions after the occurrence of an event or a flag in this case okay so the main aim of this decision is to align this decision needs is to align align the execution policy execution to policy making so as we said earlier is when the the policy decisions are typically done in the form of the proactive and what you need to do is you need to align the execution or the operations to that of the policy on a daily basis not a daily basis on a frequent basis okay this need to be done frequently 
second part is the these needs typically originates at the control layer okay or the control systems layer so the aim here is that the, the these decisions are typically driven these needs typically driven at the reactive uh, these reactive decisions are typically driven at the control system layer and time to address these decision needs are short or you require quick decisions okay so anybody who drives these decisions need to understand the fact that this decision need to be taken quickly and then the last one we need to do is the adaptive decisions okay so the adaptive decisions is something what we talk about it as the uh, ability to sense external external and unpredictable unpredictable events and adjust uh, to mitigate the impact or impacts of those events okay so here is that you know aligning in anticipation so like uh, if there is a tsunami that happens in japan how is it going to impact so a classic example is when the tsunami happened in japan it actually did affect the production of various japanese automotives in the country like especially toyota and honda in india where their engine manufacturing plants were filled with uh, uh, water and everything and they have to uh, the production ha has to be held in hold so that is where then they imported the engines from other plants and then that were they were used to cover up the Mm, uh, shortfall so that is what he call as the adaptivity in this so the origin of this the origin is from outside the system and this percolates to all four layers of decision making so that is what we are talking about the needs of decisions so continuing on to what we uh, we are talking about the decision needs and decision layers and other things let's talk about uh, you know, something called as a swot analysis this is typically something that is done by all organizations and the swot analysis is a tool that uh, that is conducted at the uh, topmost level typically and it is done for different purposes so the swot analysis typically does stands for strength weakness opportunities and threat okay so an analysis that comprises of the strength of the weakness opportunities and threat is what we call as a swot analysis so the objective of such an analysis that is done is typically to identify 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 main strength um strengths of the organization organization okay so what identify what are the main strength of the organization um and and organization that needs to be maintained so identify what are the strength of the organization that need to be maintained second is also to identify opportunities opportunities that are to be exploited okay uh then um, third one is 
identify um, threats to the organization that organization that are to be reduced okay uh, and uh, identify weakness weaknesses in the organization that uh, are to be managed okay these cases so we have to identify the main strengths that need to be maintained so you maintain the strength okay strength maintain them okay then we talk about the opportunities that need to be exploited opportunities to be exploited so exploit okay exploit the opportunities then identify the threats that are to be reduced so the threats are to be reduced and then the weakness that are to be managed so whatever the weaknesses are that need to be managed so this is the objective of the swot analysis so this kind of gives you what we call as all possible aspects of a, about an organization and it also gives you the strength that tells you how the organization can go forward grow and other things weaknesses where all we need to pay attention to so that we can manage them opportunities where we can exploit it so that we can grow we can big, big, uh, become big in the future and threats we identify which are the threats to the organization and how do we reduce them so that the organization flourishes what it is supposed to do so the, the there are um, two type of in, in a way this is done with the help of internal and external analysis and both these analysis gets consolidated in this uh, in this in this case okay the internal and anal external analysis actually gets consolidated to come in the form of a uh, the SWOT analysis so what is the external analysis when we say what are we doing here this involves the analysis of analysis of external opportunities and threats resulting from external environment okay so the opportunities and threats are typically derived from what we call as the external analysis okay the contributor to them is typically the environment in which the uh, organization is functioning so the external analysis typically provides you the uh, various opportunities that are associated with the organization and the threats that are also part of the organization the major tools that are used here major tools in this case are the pest pestle analysis those kind of things okay etc <coughs> whereas the internal analysis okay so this internal analysis this involves involves the analysis of internal strengths and uh, weaknesses from weaknesses uh, from internal analysis and competitive analysis competitor analysis so what we are doing here is that we are saying that the the internal analysis in this case and the competitor analysis put together helps us to analyze the strength and weakness of the organization okay so this comes from the internal aspect or the internal analysis 
okay. So, now the tools is like you know there are many tools that are used and the major tools include what we call as the resource audit, resource audit. Then we also call something called as a performance matrix. competitor map is are all part of the uh, internal uh, uh, internal analysis so we seen this kind of a tool which is done quite a lot of the time to decipher the strength weaknesses opportunities and threat to an organization and decisions are done based on these and you can see that for each type of analysis you require different set of tools and the analytics that are required to make decisions about each one of them to decide whether this is a strength, whether this is a weakness, whether it is an opportunity, whether it is a threat, they are different. And hence, you can also see that same as we seen in the decision layers, various layers of decisions which requires various decision needs. And same way for a SWOT analysis which is supposed to be done at a higher level at the typically at the network layer, we can see that still you require a wide variety of analytical tools to provide the capabilities to the decision maker. Another thing that we talk about today will be the customer value matrix analysis. Okay. Here is another example for this. Okay. The customer value, mat value matrix we talk about is that if the objective is to identify, identify uh, customer segments, customer segments, identify customer segments according to the according to the value uh, they provide they provide value they provide to the organization okay so the customer value matrix is typically again a high level analysis In this analysis, what you are trying to do is you are trying to identify customer segments or you are trying to classify the customer according to the value they bring to the organization. Okay. Sounds very simple, but the um, typically this, there are some important facts or important aspects that you need to understand for the customer analysis. The first thing is the customer who buy the most are not necessarily the most valuable customers. Okay. So, the quantity of purchase is not the most important aspect. So, the customer who buys the most need not be the most valuable customer. So, then who is the most valuable customer? The most valuable customers are those who can bring new valuable customers through recommendations. So, it is not just about buying. So, not just about buying, instead helping to bring more valuable customers. Okay. So, when we are saying that a person who can bring more valuable, new valuable customers through recommendation is somebody who is more important to an organization than the person who buys the most. Do not say that the person who buys the most is not important, but the other person is more important than such a person. So, a customer can be bro broken down into four categories and depending upon these categories, the way in which you deal with the decision you how, or how you decide upon how to deal with the customer also varies. The first category is what we call as the champions. Okay. The champions are typically called as high buyers or they buy high amount of call or the here is the uh, buy the most, buy the most and good advocates okay. so or recommenders or they recommend the most also. So, they buy the most, they recommend the most also. All right. Second part we talk about it is the affluence. These are the spiel, people they are called as high spending customers, 
high spending customer without making any recommendation. Recommendation. Okay. So, these are the customers who spend the mo most, they spend a lot of money, but they do not make any recommendation. Then comes the people they are called as advocates, okay. Makes the most of the recommendations, make the most of the recommendations, but do not buy buy a lot. So, these customers do not spend too much of money, they do not buy a lot, but they make most of the recommendations. So, such type of customers are called as advocates and then the last one is called as the misers. Okay. They are low value customers, customers in both purchasing and recommending. So, you have seen that depending upon the category of the customer, their behavior changes. So, if you find a customer who is a champion, if you come across a customer who is a champion, then the decisions, the decision needs for the champion is different from the decision needs of a miser. Okay. So, these decision needs are different. So, when a decision maker come across a champion customer, they would treat the customer with a different aspect than that of a miser customer. Even though yes, the rule says all customers are important, treat customers, customer is the king. But in between the kings also, there is gradations. And that type of uh, analysis that an organization do to identify the value that a customer brings into it, it is called as a customer value matrix. Using this analysis, better policies or different policies are actually set in this case. Okay. Using this, we would be able to uh, the decision maker will be able to make better decisions. So, having said all of these, what we uh, conclude from today is that the needs of making decisions depends upon the time, the layer, the significance, the scope at which the decision is to be made. And depending upon the decision needs, the data, the information that is necessary to make the decision also varies. And hence, the analytics that provides that information for the decision maker the tools, the aspects, the tricks that needs to be uh, that are associated with analytics to make that information happen to the decision maker will also change. So, this it, so that is one of the reason why no, there is no single tool to solve the problem in analytics. There is always a bunch of tools and you have to learn a lot of tools so that you can apply different tool, tools for different decision needs. I hope that makes uh, sense to you guys and we will see you in the next lecture soon. Thank you very much.